Okay, uh, so hello everyone. So I'm Pierre Zamora. So I will briefly speak about the work I am doing during my first year of PhD under the, the supervision of NFG, the National Review, and Jamin Su, uh, and the topic on risk response planning for wind farm control. Um, so uh, wind turbine extract energy from the wind to produce the electricity. So you might think that the best way to in, to 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 ensure uh, the maximization of the turbine output uh, is to make sure that it is facing the wind. And that is true, but as soon as you start working on wind farms where you have many turbines operating on the same field, you become vulnerable to what we call the wake effect. So that is that the velocity of the wind decreases and its turbulence increases behind a turbine, uh, which creates suboptimal conditions for all the turbines located downstream. So one way to avoid this uh, is to increase the angle between the turbine and the incoming wind, uh, which is called the, the yaw, to deflect the wake away from downstream turbines. Uh, so for example, here on a simple simulation uh, of a farm with three turbines, uh, choosing uh, the optimal yields for the first and second turbines allows us to increase the total power production by 22%. Uh, but finding the set of optimal yields for all turbines in a farm is a hard task for many reasons, so I will highlight two of them. Um, first, modeling the behavior of a turbulent wind inflow around many turbines uh, in the field is a hard task, uh, which means that most models are either too inaccurate or too costly to be used for real-time op optimization. And uh, as you can imagine, the complexity of the problem goes exponentially with the number of turbines in the farm. Uh, so this motivates the use of a model-free and decentralized approach. Um, so during my work, I tried to see whether a data-driven approach like reinforcement learning could, pro could provide a solution. So in, re in reinforcement learning, we directly try to infer uh, the best sequence of actions or policy um, just by observing the system's responses to changes in the input. So in our case, the system is the wind form, the inputs are the yields, and the output uh, is a total power production of the turbine. Uh, of all the turbines. Um, so doing this, we reformulate our objective as a maximization of an expectation uh, of the sum of the content rewards, with the reward being a signal that will guide the learning of the agents in, in the form. Um, then we can use existing algorithm in the reinforcement in the reinforcement learning literature, like Q-learning, which will converge to um, the optimal policy. Uh, so concretely, uh, we have a decentralized multi-agent approach, which means that every turbine is modeled as an agent and maintains so its own uh, state, which is the observation of the environment. Uh, so this state so at every time step is uh, for every agent its own yield, as well as a common measure of the wind conditions taken at the entrance of the farm, uh, well, which allows us to limit the number of capitals needed for the algorithm and therefore it, its cost. Um, so then every agent uh, chooses um, among a set of of actions to either move left, right, or stay still and um, maintain its previous yield. So provided that we can define a reward that is uh, that is aligned with an with our uh, broader objective or maximization, we would have defined a mark of um, mark of the decision process, and we then we can then use uh, the Kulani algorithm in it to uh, maximize the production of our farm. So here uh, we have done just that, and we have tested uh, our algorithm uh, on a simple farm of three turbines. Um, so the farm was simulated in an environment called fast farm. And uh, so under stationary wind conditions with a turbulent wind of 8%, uh, we are able to increase the total power production of the farm by 20%. This is with the algorithm running uh, sim simultaneously on every turbine and uh, every turbine being uh, oblivious to the existence of the other turbines. And finally, this can be combined with a warm sort approach where we will use a model-based optimization method in a simpler a system, in a simple simulation environment uh, to initialize our reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so the next step is to switch to non-stationary wind conditions and assess the scalability uh, of the algorithm on larger wind farms. 
so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, how would you implement this in practice? Because let's say that I have a wind farm. Yeah. And how, how does the learning happen? Does it happen on the real uh, wind turbines or do I need to simulate my wind farm? But in which case I need a model of my wind farm? Uh, so in the well, so ideally it will happen directly on the wind farm. So the learning. The yes. Learning, okay. so, so the learning, um, so basically what we're doing right now is that this, our simulation uh, is a relatively high fidelity and we are just use it as a proxy for the real farm. Okay, because when you say high fidelity, and I know nothing about this, but I guess like that wind and all this thing, it's like very- Yes, it's very hard stuff. to simulate, yes, so yes. yes. Maybe that's big difference between- Exactly, but that's one of the reasons why we actually try to, well, the, uh, tend towards using reinforcement learning because the idea is that the algorithm will be able to continuously adapt and then you can re recover uh, from uh, the suboptimal behavior that can then due to the to the inaccuracy in the model. So. Uh, Macaulay was uh, asking. <laughs> Uh, yes, I was wondering, you said that, that uh, the problem uh, grows exponentially with the number of uh, turbines and it's not clear for you. Uh, yes, so actually it's, uh, yes, yeah, so in the... Because I, I have the intuition that you could uh, um, drive each of uh, the device independently and uh, choose uh, the best uh, angle for each of them. Independently, and so I do not see the exponential. Uh... Yes, but that's what we do. So we we use a decentralized approach so that we can allow us to not have this uh, this sequential dependence because we could use a centralized approach, but what we would have to uh, consider uh, the joint state space and action space of, of all of the agents, and this would create an exponential dependence on, yes. on the number of turbines, and that's one of the reasons why we would prefer to use a decentralized approach. But it comes with its own challenges because then, uh, well, learning is a non stationary for, the, for every agent. So. Just a slight recommendation, if I may. You have a, a, a small amount of time, and I believe that your presentation is a bit long. In particular, you do not have time to present each formula and each plot. You don't yes. have time to read them, and okay, sometimes yeah. it's written too small. So okay, thank you. It's not uh, very appropriate. I would have had the okay. same comment. Yeah, my question is about the time scale. If you want to really deploy this and we, uh, we like dynamically to the change or okay, the wind conditions, what are the time scales and uh, which type of communication will, uh, are adapted to that? Means you will run the algorithm directly on the uh, on the, end, the, the, uh, the wind farm, mm -hmm. or are you going to move the data to a cloud? Do you have time to do that? Uh, well, in terms of, of, of time, so right now we have a Convergence. When, when we use the warm up approach, uh, we have a convergence uh, in approximately three days, which is a long time. So that's one of the challenges is to decrease the, the time of convergence, especially as for now it's under stationary wind conditions, which is also not realistic. Uh, so that's yes, one, one of the challenges is to, uh, to, to accelerate these, these convergence. And in terms of more uh, practical issues, so right now we already have a, um, a communications um, on existing wind farms, so communication devices. Uh, since wind farms are, are usually monitored, so they already have captures, mm -hmm. and there is already a system in place to uh, mm -hmm. gather that data. So ideally, we would be able to uh, plug ourselves on this existing system to to allow for communication for the algorithm to to function. Okay, but uh, when you need to recompute uh, because the uh, wind conditions are changing, I, I think that you are not just based on this uh, stationary view, right? Uh, yes. You will define a, a point of operation and then you will move around yes. based on what you're monitoring in real time. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. And so. what is the time scale you <laughs> require for that? For this uh, adaptation in real time. Oh, okay. Uh, so right now, what we well, what we are hoping to, to do uh, is to associate so each time step in the algorithm uh, with a measure of, of the wind. So right now we have a, uh, uh, we have new action taken approximately every one thousand seconds. 
so so that's uh, what we how the algorithm is designed now but uh, we haven't done conclusive experiences for now in the in the non-stationary wind, wind conditions mm -hmm. so that's uh, that's just uh, yeah. that's, uh, well, uh, yes I just have a, a, a last and quick question. There was a, a photo in one of your slides. Uh, yes. Yeah. No, is it a, a true photo or is it something that was just made by a computer? Because it, I think it illustrates, it illustrates well what you are. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's a, a true one. Yes, it's yeah. a true one. It's, it's, an, really, uh, that, it's uh, an offshore uh, range. Yes, it's an offshore range. Okay. Well, just, just to know why it wasn't. Okay. So thanks again. If you say wait, well, there's a problem that you, that you are working on. So now, uh, Thomas Lecor. Okay, you can start with one. Okay, so I'm uh, Thomas Lecor, and I'm supervised by uh, Anna Luzic. And I will present what I'm doing right now, uh, working on the control of flexibilities in an electrical grid, power grid. So to to look at the context, uh, to today we are integrating more and more renewable energies, and it's uh, causing some issue because of the fact that there are more solar energy uh, during the day than in the night. So we want to use maybe some flexibility of the demand uh, to be able to consume energy when we have some, and not uh, when we don't have any. So we want to move the demand uh, during the day. So if we want to mathematize a bit the, uh, this problem, uh, the objective is to modify the behavior of a certain number of, uh, of the consumers in order for their global consumption uh, to follow a given signal. Uh, so for example, the signal of demand uh, of the last uh, slide. So to model this situation, uh, we want to minimize a certain cost function, which is the following. Uh, with a part which is the distance to the signal. So here is the signal and here is the global consumption. Um, and also the distance to the normal behavior. So we want a compromise between these two terms, not to modify too much the behavior of the consumers and also to be, to be uh, to get closer to the signal uh, of the demand. And also that's a bit, uh, uh, we want to preserve the initial law. We don't want to, uh, to, 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 move, to move that. So to solve this problem, uh, we will use uh, dualization and the gradient descent algorithm. So that's a classic uh, optimization uh, method. So, but to do that, we have to compute some element of a parent choice family, uh, mu lambda phi, which are the which are the the consumption apparent parameterized by the, uh, the the Lagrangian, and we we will use the important sampling uh, method, which is to generate a certain number of, of uh, of uh, trajectories uh, with uh, an instrumental law, and then we'll do a weight in Monte Carlo. Uh, so the, the, we are doing that uh, because we want to uh, deviate for the, from the Markovian case, which has been studied in the literature. And also, if we will generate less tra trajectories, it will, be, it will become uh, faster. And, uh, the, uh, but the issue is that this approximation is less and less precise as we deviate from the instrumental law. So to, to, to do that, we will use a proximal algorithm. Uh, so it's just the, the global ID, but uh, the idea is that we will update the instrumental law at some point where we are too far from the instrumental law. And also we will penalize during the, the gradient descent algorithm uh, not to get too far from this instrumental law. And the, the results, uh, when we apply this model to a population of water eaters, uh, so they have some flexibility due to the temperature inertia of their water tank tanks. Uh, so here in uh, in blue, uh, we have the consumption for the normal behavior. So if we do nothing, uh, they will have this global consumption. In uh, orange, we have the signal. So for example, the demand I uh, want to follow. And in the green, we have the compromise or a certain uh, parameter uh, between these two, uh, these two, uh, uh, these two objects, the normal behavior and the signal. And uh, in the future, the next step uh, I want to, to work on are to look at non-Markovian dynamics. So that was the objective of the important sampling, but uh, I, I, I haven't uh, dig uh, deeper on this subject. 
and also to look at uh, unknown or partial known uh, dynamics. Uh, so to look at what happens if we uh, know less about the dynamics and also to to see if these results are robust, if the signal change uh, during the day. So if, uh, I don't know, to, during the day, the, the signal uh, will uh, will change. Uh, is it possible to uh, to use uh, the flexibilities uh, to uh, to get closer to the, to the signal uh, after that or not? Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm sorry if I, if I missed the point. Uh, but the, the goal is to is to um, control the electrical consumptions of users, right? Of people. Yeah. And uh, so what? So to change the signal, you need to go on or off some. Uh, I guess it's a control problem. Yeah, it is. Okay. 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 Like okay. Understood. Like. Uh, so you give some action to do based on some thing. Yeah, the idea uh, is that it's, uh, sorry, I didn't uh, uh, explain the whole uh, kind of behavior, but the idea is that you are sending some signal to the consumers, uh, which indicates in a way uh, how, the, how the, the, the total power grid is. So if you have any uh, energy or not, and then uh, each, um, each consumer is adjusting with this signal and, uh, and uh, the, the temperature of the, of the text so it's, uh, Okay. If, if for so example, giving an algorithm, given this signal, what will it? Yeah. I was wondering, so uh, I like uh, the mathematical model. I love maths. And <laughs> but I was wondering, for this kind of problems, do we, don't, don't we already have already simple and uh, tractable solution? For example, if you take the example of the problem, uh, you, sweep, you turn on uh, the temperature and uh, the coven will uh, produce heat while reaching the temperature and then stop, yeah. wait that the temperature decrease and below a, a given threshold, uh, produce uh, produce it uh, uh, another time. And so it's very simple, it's just yeah. an hysteresis yeah. and it's over. So why do we require so complex maths? Is it because uh, your law is far more complicated, uh, your, the law that you try to reach is far more complicated and so the problem is far more complicated and so require more maths or uh, does a sort of simple solution like hysteresis would, uh, would be fine for this kind of problem yeah so so, so what, what you describe is the normal behavior of uh, any water heaters so reaching a, a max temperature and then decreasing to a lower to low one uh, and the idea is that if you want to, to change this uh, behavior so if you want uh, for the water heater to to change from on to off at some point, even if it's not at the max temperature, uh, we have to do some math to to be able to, to change that, uh, like it is our algorithm. And so do you believe that your tool uh, will uh, help to reach the appropriate temperature faster, for example? Uh, it's not really, um, what, what, what we want to preserve is the fact that the consumer will be in a, in an interval of, uh, of minimum temperature or maximum temperature, not not exactly to reach a certain temperature. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's to 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 be between 50 and 70, mm -hmm. but not to be at 65. Precisely, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's not really the objective. Okay, it's not clear for me why it changes significantly the problem, but uh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can talk uh, later. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a question, but what is this dimensional? Okay, yeah. The idea is that when you when you do some event something, uh, you will generate uh, uh, some uh, some. Well, I'm including that to try try trajectory is just the temperature during the during the during a day, for example. And um, the idea is that if if you generate temperature according to a certain behavior, uh, it's possible to uh, compute. For different behavior, but with the same uh, with the same object, just that you are, that you will uh, will weight differently uh, these uh, these uh, trajectories. So it's a weighted Monte Carlo, okay. uh, but you will not have to compute at each time uh, the the the, the tra trajectories. Okay. And what I call the instrumental law is the law generating the trajectories you, you will use. Okay, that's just uh, a so term in the literature. Any questions?
we have one. Uh, there was a formula in one of your slides uh, with two components, like this one. Uh, so if I understood well, you want to yes, minimize this function. And there is a parameter, uh, kappa. Uh, do you try to like, uh, do you have some method methodology to choose the right one, uh, the right parameters? Or, or do you fix the value of kappa in, in, in practice? I don't have any uh, methodology to choose the, the right one. Uh, the idea is just that uh, that's something you can use uh, to, to adjust the compromise if you want more to emphasize the distance signal. It's a compromise, but do we have some guidance to, to, to say to, to, to somebody that we, we would like to use your methodology to say you should this one or this one according to that uh, what you want to do? Uh, yes, we have some if it's plus infinity, um, <laughs> maybe, but uh, it's not really uh, a thing like that. Oh. Ah non, bon. on l'avait déjà utilisé, non? Euh... Je pense que... Ça va? Non, euh, we do not receive the presenter view. Ah, une, comme euh, toujours. Alors, euh, attends. Je fais ça. J'arrête le partage un instant. Pardon. Hein. Ça, ça. Euh, je me souviens, ça... non, je sais, mais je voulais éviter. Euh, comment je fais la fiche? Je crois. Euh, you know. En bas à gauche, près du slider, un peu à gauche, encore à gauche. Non, depuis la droite, à gauche du slider. Il y en a une de celle-là qui est à gauche. Normal? Normal. Il y a pas vraiment, c'est la plus à droite. Encore à droite, encore à droite, place. Oui, c'est ça, ça que j'ai fait. Mais... Ah non, non, non. Yeah, OK. That I know. It's just... Okay. Oui, oui, oui. Ça, je sais. OK. OK. Et, on, et je partage... Uh, so you can just share this screen. OK. C'est OK? Mm -hmm. Pardon, moi, tu dis OK. And then, uh, presentation mode. The problem is presentation one is actually the other one, but not this one, but the view of the presenter. Okay, I don't remember how we switch. Do you have one screen or two screens? C'est la manière de partager en fait, probablement. Attendez. Là, je fais présentation. Écran noir. Ah non, ça c'est le j'ai déjà fait. C'est ça que je fais. On va essayer comme ça. Il y a toujours une présentation en cours ou pas Il vérifie. Okay. Oh, wow. <rire> Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so I will start today. I present um, what we've been doing uh, in the course of my PhD uh, under the supervision of my supervisor, Shannon Bushich, and the Carter and the Salo de Terre. 
And um, my presentation um, is about game theoretic approaches in the electricity markets. So electricity markets give the main motivation for our problem, mostly due to the inclusion of renewables uh, into uh, current electricity market and into future electricity markets. There are more uncertainties, uh, more small producers, more uh, consumers switching to being consumers, uh, and uh, thus having some strategy behaviors that might um, lead them to participating differently in the electricity market, and that's what we want to account for. So in our work, we focus on the decentralized markets, um, contrary to classical centralized ones. Uh, centralized are being used as benchmark. And in these uh, decentralized electricity markets, the main uh, aspects that we uh, inquire uh, are privacy. So that was the work, uh, the first work that we've done when we used the noise added to uh, private information of the consumers, then including network constraints when, when we wanted to map uh, uh, financial market um, between the consumers uh, on the physical grid uh, controlled by the DSO. And the last work that we've been working on uh, is about risk management, risk hedging in these decentralized electricity markets. So I will be speaking about uh, that uh, work today. And in order to present it first, we start with the decentralized market so that we have. Uh, so imagine that uh, there are consumers that want to trade electricity among each other, but also they want to uh, hedge their risk uh, that appear, uh, hedge their risks that appear due to inclusion of renewables and uh, maybe some uncertainties uh, of their demand. And because of that, they might use uh, some financial contract uh, interagent trading uh, that allows them to hedge the risks of each other. So there are buyers of, of these contracts, there are sellers of contracts among the customers. But what if there is a big player that wants to participate in the market as well? So we can represent it as an insurance company, the sole purpose of which is to sell the insurance. So uh, it can be a taker of the insurance, but it can sell infinite amount of them. And uh, if um, it is that big, then it might influence the market as a leader of the market, which leads us to a stackable game. Uh, so two level problem, two by level problem, basically, when the insurance company is on top, is on upper level, and this electricity and the recession market of the consumers is on the upper level now. So I will briefly describe, describe what uh, happens in this problem. So if we have a response function of the consumers, then uh, some of them will certainly buy, some of them will certainly not buy insurances, but um, those who are indifferent, they affect uh, heavily the outcome for the insurance company. So they can choose to cooperate or they can choose to defect. And that leads uh, the insurance company to either very good uh, optimistic outcome or either pessimistic one. And in the pessimistic one, there might be no solution. Uh, how to resolve this problem? Yeah, there's an illustration of no solution in the pessimistic framework. How can we solve it? Using some price incentives. So uh, uh, why there's no solution? Because you can see that uh, this point is not included in the response set in the pessimistic framework. So agents are reluctant uh, uh, here to buy the insurances. And here there is no possibility to reach the equilibrium between agents. So what happens, we use some price incentives. We move uh, the price of insurances just a little bit to the left, uh, and then we are on continuous scale. And here, uh, prosumers will gladly buy the insurances because for them, they're a little bit cheaper, uh, those prosumers who are indifferent. And um, yeah, it, is, it might be seem quite uh, intuitive, but uh, uh, what is hidden behind is that uh, on the upper level, we split prosumers, uh, each prosumer into two, uh, adding some entities uh, that are, that want to cooperate with the insurance company, that want to deflect from insurance company, etc. But the idea of the market is super simple. And what are the conclusions? That big company leads to cycle break game, which is quite trivial, but in this pessimistic formulation, which is natural to consider, there might be no solution. How can we overcome it? Uh, design price-based incentives, so motivate consumers to buy ins insurances cheaper. And then uh, these incentives slightly decrease the profits of insurance company, but they allow to consumers to decrease their costs. So yes, exactly five minutes and thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, 
properly. So my question will be a bit uh, stupid, but what I understand is you try to solve a kind of game theory problem. Yes. If I'm correct. Uh, and so the players are uh, the consumers. Yes. Is correct. Yes. And uh, that's kind of, then I'm stuck, to be honest. <laughs> what is the interest of the player? So they, they try to sell electricity? Or okay, the... yes, indeed. So uh, because uh, some of the oh, oh, some of the players have um, renewable production, they mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometimes they want to sell energy, some, sometimes they have mm -hmm. a shortage of energy and they would, would like to buy. But if, uh, I, if I produce energy, for example, yes. it's always in my interest to sell the energy that I do not consume. Yes, of course. So that was where happened. is the decision of the player? If I am always interested by selling my, my uh, overhead of electricity. Uh, but uh, you see, there might be not enough uh, uh, buyers for your energy in the market. If, uh, for example, it's a sunny day and you produced uh, a lot of energy, then might be your neighbors did the same. So the question is how to sell the price and how to clear the market. And but, uh, I can't accumulate this energy. So yeah, I so sell it uh, at a low price and that's all. No. That's, that's a good question because uh, uh, you have flexibility of demand mm -hmm. and because of the, so there are several parameters that you have. So you have an uh, active generation that you can activate. You have some renewables that just uh, are a variable because uh, you either produce it or not. And uh, you have flexible demand. So based on these decision variables, you uh, have plenty of possibilities to decide, have plenty of strategies. For example, you, whether you want to decrease your demand, whether you want to increase your demand, whether you want to reach a target demand, whether you want to trade. Yes, you don't no, if you have flexible demand, you can control it. Uh, with the, indeed, with the use uh, of uh, like demand flexibility, uh, if you have some batteries, uh, then you can store energy. If you, uh, uh, if you can store energy, yes, you can, uh, yes, but we, we do not consider, yes, exactly. We okay. do not consider this problem of storage exactly, it is just included in the flexibility of demand. Okay, so this is maybe what I missed uh, yeah, okay, in yes. the presentation, yes. because always, uh, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like mention that, that uh, uh, agents are quite flexible. Oh, in, okay. in the model. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? So just uh, in one of your last slides, uh, there is something uh, I, I did not understand. You were, I think you were a bit too, too fast. Uh, in uh, after, after. For your solution, yes, price incentives, you are talking about price incentives, but I do not see what, to what it corresponds. To what it corresponds? Yes, so this is a um, uh, response function of the uh, consumers uh, to the price uh, set by insurance company. And if the price is set just a bit lower, which is basically a price incentive, if you decrease a little bit the price, then consumers are more motivated to buy your insurances. That's a very simple idea. Uh, but um, mm, uh, the main idea is that uh, it not only, uh, yeah, it is trivial that it decreases the profits of insurance company, it decreases the costs of uh, consumers, but the main idea is that it allows us to uh, have a solution because otherwise, if you don't have them, then you don't have a solution. So it's not possible to compete on equilibrium. And the thing I did not, did not understand is why do we, do we have insurance company here? It is for insurance for what? Yes, uh, so if uh, there are a lot, there are plenty of possibilities so why you might have an insurance company. Because of, first of all, uh, you might not have enough uh, risk cash supply financial contracts on the lower level. So you might, so the first stage were considered was a uh, interagent financial contracts trading, but it might be the case that uh, agents can't supply enough financial contracts in order to hedge all the risks of the system. So, in order to compensate for that, you have to have another uh, big big entity that can provide you an infinite source of insurances. Infinite, it's an assumption, of course, but in the scale of the market. But also, you can just uh, take an uh, insurance company as granted because. Uh, in real world, there are always big players in the market, especially in the insurance markets. And that's how markets of insurances are organized currently. It's, it's not like there, are, there is a lot of um, reciprocal help. It's more that some big company controls the insurance market. And that's what we wanted to see, the interaction between these two, two approaches. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay.
Christian Venice, now I understand the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good. What do you try to optimize? Is it the, the income of, uh, of the individual players? Or mm -hmm. is it to guarantee that you always have uh, electricity? And so uh, maybe you try to, to, to get a high margin uh, on uh, what produce uh, Uh, the players because you know that they do not have residual capacity and so they have to sell uh, urgently uh, their electricity. So that, that you, you might imagine a lot of problems and so it's not clear to me what is the problem that you solve. Yes, I didn't specify it here, but uh, the utility function that we consider, so we minimize the costs of the consumers. So it's uh, each, each consumers, okay. So we have two entities here, insurance company and consumers. Insurance company, of course, maximizes its profits. So the revenue that it gets after an insurance training. Uh, prosumers, by, uh, they minimize their costs. So their costs in, include uh, a generation cost, uh, trading cost, or whether it is cost, maybe they get some profit from trading, that's also possible. Um, uh, costs of buying insurances, revenue from getting insurance, like uh, payments from, ins from insurances. And uh, the, the last is the uh, difference between uh, So basically, utility of consum consumption utility. So the difference, uh, correct, the difference between uh, their flexible demand that they go for and their target demand. Another way to rephrase my question, yeah. if I may, is uh, who would deploy uh, this algorithm? Is it a single player, for example, to optimize its, its own revenue? Is it all the players? Uh, and this is, for example, the electricity company that impose it uh, to guarantee that you always have electricity at a low cost. You what I mean? Yes, I understand what you mean. I think, but uh, if may, maybe maybe not, but <laughs> but based uh, okay. So if I understand it correctly, then I would answer that all the players employ this problem because it's a game theoretic problem. There is no central entity that um, imposes uh, this. There is no central entity that solves everything. But it's a game theoretic problem, and uh, every we, we just generally describe the. Utility function, which we find more most reasonable for, for such a problem. We do not have decide on the particular properties of this uh, utility function, on the coefficients, etc. This is per region based. But uh, yes, we model that each agent solves individually, egoistically, uh, this particular problem, which formulates then a big game. Okay. I hope. <laughs> Thank you. What? Okay. okay, so hello everyone, I'm Luca Weber, a first year PhD student at INRIA in the Georgian team. So I'm working on connections between reinforcement learning and control theory. And my work is supervised by Anna Buzi and Jamin Zhu. So the motivation behind my thesis comes from the observation that both methods, reinforcement learning and optimal control, try to solve the same kind of problems. In reinforcement learning, we learn from experience, for example, through interactions with an environment. Whereas in optimal control, we try to construct a model as robust as possible, and then we use it to minimize the cost function. So my goal is to combine both methods to obtain, let's say, more efficient algorithms. So I have been interested in two questions. The first one is how to use structure in reinforcement learning. So for instance, for admission control in LMCKQs with multiple classes of customers, which is represented here, we know the shape of an optimal policy. So for instance, if we represent, if the role represents the number of clients already in the system and the columns represent the class of the incoming customer, we know that there exists uh, an optimal policy that has a shape that looks like this. The question is, 
know, how to use this knowledge in reinforcement learning. So the second question is how to deal with constraints such as state constraints. So I'm going to develop the example of a battery for which the, we want uh, the final state, well, the state of charge at the end of the day to be equal to a certain value. So let's say we have a user that has a battery. During the day, a solar panel charges the battery. Then the user can uh, interact with the electricity network. It can sell electricity or buy it. So our goal is to minimize the electricity bill. We consider different selling and buying prices. For the model, we consider a linear model with charging and discharging efficiencies. And for the constraints, while well, we want uh, the state of charge at the end of the day to be equal to the initial state of charge. So I have applied reinforcement learning to this problem. So for the state, uh, the state that I consider is a state of charge at time t, so it's written in a couple x t. What we control is the power that is bought or sold to the electricity network. And what well, I have applied uh, tabular learning for which I have uh, discretized the state and action spaces. And I have used the usual uh, update formula with um, a discount factor equal to one because this is an episodic task well, uh, with a fixed length. And so well, let's consider for now that we know everything. We know the power that will be produced and we know the energy that will be consumed. We also know the selling and buying prices of the electricity. So we can use a solver, for example, Kazadi, to obtain an optimal uh, solution. And this is what I obtained. This is the trajectory which represents the charge of the battery uh, in the time, its evolution. And I get a total cost of 25.50 euros. With my simple setting of tabular learning in a linear model, I obtain a similar solution with the same cost after rounding. So, so for now, the next steps will be to solve this model, uh, well, solve this problem for a nonlinear model for which the uh, tabular learning is not as trivial. So a solution will be to get rid of tabular learning, uh, for instance, by using a function approximation so that I don't need to discretize anything anymore. Furthermore, I also need to find if there are better ways to implement the constraint. So what I'm doing right now is that I add a penalty if the final state is not equal to the goal state. And then I let this uh, penalty propagate. But there may be other algorithms that come with better solutions. So this is something I need to explore. And finally, well, I have supposed that I know everything, the consumption and production, which is not the case in practice. So I need to add stochasticity. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? So I have one yes. in one of your first slides. Yeah. Uh, uh, after. After. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, it was uh, around this slide. Yes. Uh, so you say that you have uh, we know how to get uh, an optimal solution. We know the we know that there exists an optimal solution that has a structure that looks like this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so why do you need uh, reinforcement? What is the 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 benefit to try to get something with a reinforcement learning. Because we may, for instance, for instance, we may not know the transition rates of the system. So this is something that we can learn, actually. Uh, we may, for instance, not know the number of servers. So this is also something we can learn. And so, yeah. So, so there is an optimal solution that you may, may know if you know everything. And yes, exactly, and yes. You don't know everything, so that's why you are using it. Yes. Okay. But for instance, we can learn the parameters. This is an approach. I have a question. So, sorry, it was hard to find a question because the presentation is very well structured. So, Thanks. reflection for this, and it's clear what is your problem, what is uh, your approach, and what is uh, your next uh, step. So, it's very good. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering um, so, to connect, uh, say, the yep. mastered uh, place of your problem, so the solver, etc., and the Q learning, do you envision to solve instances in an exact manner to? Uh, produce instances to feed your Q learning algorithm and to train it? Is it something like this? Uh, well, it's not what I planned, but it is a possibility, yes. Mm -hmm. Like to train, uh, to get an initial value, I suppose. For example? Yeah, it is a possibility. If you can speed up things, well, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Okay. And uh, wh what are your other um, directions uh, to, to connect the, the both points? 
uh, well, one idea was to try to use PPO, well, for the reinforcement learning part, and then see whether it was possible to find a good way to explore new policies that still respect the constraints. Well, actually, well, my big difficulty right now is the exploration part, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All your questions? So, thank you again. Thank you.